So the sizzle reel kind of came about of, you know, I've got some personality. I've got a lot of things I can show off. Um, I'm going to do that. So I have something to share with the network, the community that doesn't take a lot of reading, that doesn't take a lot of effort. Um, I can attach it as part of my portfolio. And if people want to pass it around, recruiters want to take a 100 second look at it and say, I want to talk to that person. That's going to be that's going to be how I stand out over resume after resume after cover letter after cover letter after cover letter. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Hired, where I talk to folks who have recently transitioned into instructional design positions. So today I'm really excited to talk to Joe Sinart, who I met through social media earlier this year. And I think he has a lot of great tips and a great story to tell about his journey. And now he is in a role that he loves and is really excited about what he does. And I mean, that's the dream, right? So hopefully uh, we'll be a hat. And you get a hat. That's, <laughs> that's a big deal. I love it. So uh, do you care to tell people a little bit about uh, just about you, Joe, and your background? Yeah. So uh, my background, my degree is actually in graphic design, um, but I graduated in 2006. So all the lingering marketing agencies from 9-11 started to finally collapse. Uh, so I didn't really have a great place to go out of college. So when you go to art school and you don't have a place to go, you usually land in retail. Um, which is where I did. I did a bunch of that. Um, and eventually I fell into training about a decade ago, uh, working at uh, Constant Contact. They're a call center, they're an email marketing firm. Um, so I did not have any formal education. Uh, I did not have any, I didn't have any certificates. I had no training in training or instructional design, um, but my natural ability got me pretty far. Uh, so I did a blend of, um, or I should say from that job, a lot of the stuff that I did was for was enterprise agencies. So I kind of went from small business, constant contact to fortune 500, uh, and that's eBay. And then I continued that on with Epsilon and then, uh, did a short stint at Salesforce, which we're probably going to talk about. Um, and then I've landed, uh, very, com very comfortably at a, at a market tech company yet again, uh, which is a company called Braze. Uh, and they're, uh, they're a fantastical group. So that's, that's kind of my journey. Um, I think like a lot of people, they've kind of fallen into training and try to figure out, I right, well, where do we go from here? I'm no different. <laughs> I, lo I love the story. So, I mean, I feel like there's kind of this common thread, but one thing you said that really stood out to me is, you know, my natural talent got me really far. And I find often when I talk to people who are looking for ID jobs, or maybe they've never formally been called an ID, that imposter syndrome just like really kind of gets, gets in their head, right? Uh, so oh, man, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about kind of if you had a breaking point with your kind of natural talent or what you did about that? I had a ton of those. I had a lot of weird breaking points. And the thing that was nice is that, you know, like I said, my career got me very, very far. And I'm fortunate that I got to say I worked for eBay and I got to say I worked for all these big companies. And that little confidence boost helped me get past some of the uh, some of the silliness. By the way, everyone, that's Luna. Um, <laughs> um, but when it got to points, especially during this unemployment, this, you know, this, this last job hunt, I'm looking out of the industry and I'm seeing, I'm seeing all these jobs that now I'm suddenly fighting for amongst a whole lot of other people. You, you, these other jobs I kind of fell into, I knew somebody. Um, so yeah, going up against somebody who I knew had the master's degree, I knew had the, had the managerial training. Any, any time I saw a manager. I felt managers were coming after a position. I was like, I'm done. I shouldn't even try. Um, so it happens pretty aggressively. Um, I think one of the other things that really sparked it were there were a lot of job descriptions that threw a lot of, prof not professional, sorry, the industry knowledge at you. Um, I saw a lot of must understand Bloom's taxonomy, must understand uh, you, Kirkpatrick's four levels of evaluation, must know six Ds, C, what is it, CPTD or LD certification, I don't remember what they are, um, letter, 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 letter certification. Um, and a lot of those I would look at and just kind of throw my hands up and say, I don't even have the capacity to do this. I don't, it just, it's just not going to be who I am. Um, so yeah, I, I, there, there are definitely moments where I struggled. I really appreciate that that honesty, but if it makes you feel 
any better. I found a lot of these orgs that I know put that out there, talking to people in the org that are L&D, they don't know what they are either. <laughs> Maybe I should yeah. say that, but... <laughs> So, I mean, we, we might get to this a little later, but one of the things, so I was, I was unemployed for 95 days. There's a reason I know exactly the number. Um, on 90, 95 days, I went through three, four dozen interviews. Um, and that was definitely a weakness that I always recognized. And one of the things that I learned to do throughout this was tackle that without trying to fake it till you make it. That was my first, that's my first go-to. If you don't know something, go learn it. And for me, I'm unemployed. I got time. But eventually, that's all it felt like. Eventually, I would get asked about, oh, I had, a, I had a company that literally asked, how did you use Bloom's taxonomy to accomplish XYZ task? And I tried. I tried to fake it. I tried to say, oh, I, I did, you know, here's how I leveraged apply, and here's how I thought about understand and remember and evaluate and create and, and all this nonsense. And I got asked something similar a couple, you know, I reflected on that and said, this sounds dumb. This isn't me. So a couple interviews later with a different company, I comfortably lost that one. Um, I said, I didn't. Um, I just, I owned it. Uh, and said, I have gotten through, you know, like I said, with my natural ability, I've, I've leveraged practicality a lot more. That is my journey. I'm not going to try to fake this thing that you want, um, I'm not going to do that. And that actually got me really far. When I started throwing this, the, the how well can I talk a master's degree program to you, once I threw that away and just said, here's how I've found success, inner, you know, shove in whatever methodology you want into that, I, I, I got a lot better conversations out of that. That might not work for everyone, but I didn't, I, I, the fake it till you make it just sucked. It sounded dumb. I couldn't go any further than the first question. And for that, I had like maybe two scripted lines that sounded smart. And then I just fumbled. See, I, I, I love that you own it. And so I, for me, like you're telling me something that is very kind of true and authentic, right? So I find there's so many people kind of on the opposite end of where you're at, Joe, is that, you know, they go through these master's programs, they think they're going to walk out and get a degree, but then when they go in for the job interview, they have theory down and they have learning different, um, you know, methodologies and stuff down, but they have no idea how to apply it, right? So I'm seeing the market very kind of saturated with those people as well. But the fact that you're like, listen, I don't have any of that background, but here's what I've done in practice. Here's what's worked for me. Can you talk a little bit about that? Did you highlight in your, your experience as you're interviewing, um, you know, any kind of success stories or things that you had at your former org in learning and development? I did a few of those. And you know, before I jump into that, I don't want to discount the value of master's degree knowledge. Um, but kind of like you said, that doesn't mean you just walk out and suddenly you are you are the golden child for the next company that you walk into. That's not a thing. That's not how it works. Um, and so the way that I, I tackled that, the way that I would approach it is I focused less on the successes and actually more on the challenges and how I tackle the challenges. Um, I think as an ID, when you're working in an organization where you've got all of these other stakeholders, you have all these different audiences, the challenges are, are the thing you've got to understand. If you don't do that, it doesn't matter how good you are. Um, there's no, and I focused on that, there's no methodology, there's no ideology, there's no taxonomy, there's no master's degree that will override, did you actually accomplish what your stakeholders wanted? <laughs> there's, there's, that's not something that happens. If I go to a product owner, I do product training mostly. If I go to a product owner and I say, I completed this training and say, this doesn't serve our needs. I can't say, well, I used maker, so you're just wrong. They don't care. Um, and that's kind of how I presented it is that a lot of the learners, a lot of people who I talk to, you know, who I, who I work for a lot of my clients, which is internal and external, the people I train, they don't know these methodologies. They don't know these taxonomies. They don't know that if I do a micro learning, I'm doing it for a reason. They don't come to me and thank me and say, thank you for that interaction. It really helped enforce my learning. That's not a thing that happens. Um, and I just, I kind of owned that, you know, that's, 
that's from that's that's where my strength comes in is the ability to gauge that and understand when it's valuable and when it's not not when i check the box that says i need to have one when does it make sense and i have learned through my experience how to weed that out when does it make sense when should i throw in this type of thing and I, how do i work with smes and stakeholders and these groups who i'm going to need to rely on so they understand that vision they understand the value of that and they understand how i'm going to execute and how i need them none of that is is a master's degree program right. none of that fits in in a methodology and well actually that's not true i just learned about Knowles and Androvagi, which <laughs> that's basically what that says is throw all that stuff away just be practical um but none of that approach is is something that i felt like i needed an education for to understand i just i did it i did it for nine years i've done it for nine years and that resonated with them that resonated with the managers and hiring managers um and if it didn't i probably didn't belong in that company there you go and i, I don't care where you go and i'm sure you know this through your experience but mm -hmm. don't matter where you work there's still this kind of onboarding process on how that org approaches the learning function regardless yeah. right so you're going to have to kind of get used to how they like things done and how they do things and etc so um, I'm going back, like, I was thinking, like, when we had first met and started talking, one thing that you did that I think is genius, and I'd love to talk a little bit more about it, is in your portfolio, you created this, like, sizzle reel, right? So do you care to tell a little bit about, like, what your thought process was behind that, some of the things maybe you included in it? Because I think that's something I think other people would like to hear a little bit more about. I love that sizzle reel, and I... I came up with a kind of rant, like sizzle reels are a thing. They're, they're a very common thing in the industry. And for those who don't know exactly what a sizzle reel is, usually this is done by like television studios, um, networks that kind of throw out um, this really cool, fun to watch thing that highlights key, you know, key moments of, of whatever their plan is. You're probably used to seeing it like NBC's fall lineup. And it's this two minute music video that highlights all these cool shows that are coming out and new seasons. That's called a sizzle reel. Um, it is literally there to sizzle um, and uh, and get people kind of excited. Um, so I, I decided to throw one of those together because it became a struggle to explain the goofiness that is me, um, <laughs> really. Um, and I also got really tired of of not being allowed to throw personality in the first, my first impression, I felt like I had to either defend that lack of knowledge, or I had to shove in your face. This is what my experience was. Um, so the sizzle reel kind of came about of, you know, I've got some personality, I've got a lot of things I can show off. Um, I'm going to do that. So I have something to share with the network, the community that doesn't take a lot of reading, that doesn't take a lot of effort. Um, I can attach it as part of my portfolio, and if people want to pass it around, recruiters want to take a 100-second look at it and say, I want to talk to that person, that's going to be that's going to be how I stand out over resume after resume after cover letter after cover letter after cover letter. And yeah, I went around. It got, it got, it got really popular. Um, I focused on, you know, what are the key things I wanted to show off? Uh, which for me was give a little background to my actual experience. So it's kind of like a quick recap of my resume. Um, what are some of the things I'm proudest of that don't always fit in the resume? Um, like the number of years I have working with Fortune 500, the number of years that I have in graphic design and film and video for an instructor and a designer resume that might not fit. I might have better things to, uh, to put in there. Um, I got to, I have a, I have a blog. Um, also I got to throw off a few, throw a few things out there for the blog. I got to show a little bit of my work. I'm not entirely proud of, of exactly what I showed, but it's there. You can see that there was, you know, a whole document, a process. And yeah, I just, I wanted something fun that I can, I can attach to, to, to posts and, and applications. That was just a small commitment that told people a whole lot about me. And it was a lot of fun to put together. And see, this is so important. I just think it's so important to be yourself and be 
your authentic self and, and own it. And uh, if you watch the first episode of this series, you saw me talk to Erica Zimmer. And one thing that she did is in her cover letter, she told a story. So instead of say, listing all these qualifications, whatever, she's mm-hmm. like, listen, I'm a woodworker. I love dogs. Yeah. And I she and bringing in some of her own personality to it, I really thought made it special. And same with you. The fact that you bring in some of these elements of your personality with sizzle reel it's so important and i just get so perplexed when people are like i don't know what to put in my portfolio i was like put a piece of your heart in it right like if you love cats make something about cats if you like star wars make something about star wars let i mean it doesn't have to be so stuffy and formal and i feel like so many portfolios that i've seen are just so formal and stuffy i don't i don't know what do you, what do you see out there so when it comes to my portfolio, I struggled a lot, actually, because I one of the challenges with a portfolio, especially if you've worked for companies, is that you're kind of bound by NDA. Um, you know, I can't share a whole lot of things. And I worked for marketing agencies, so I can't tie you know, my time with eBay with the clients for eBay that I work with. I can't show you the training materials that I made for them unless I generalized it to the point where it was probably just bad. Um, that's just that was the nature of that position. I would do things specifically cater to to clients. Um, but one of the tricks I learned with the portfolio was that you don't always have to you don't always have to do that. You don't always have to tie a client that you worked for with the job that you worked for. And I got this. Um, I, I spoke to somebody else who helped me out with this. Um, so one of the tactics that I used in my portfolio is I didn't show the work. Um, I don't have a lot of documents. I don't have video, a lot of videos in my portfolio, unless I knew that they were safe or for companies that don't exist anymore. Um, But I was able to go through my plan. I was able to go through various projects that I had for these clients. Yes, I have worked for Walgreens. Yes, I have worked for Southwest Airlines. I did a project for them. I can't show you that project, but I can walk you through my process. I can tell you the challenges. I can tell you what I, you know, how I approached it and what the final results were and what success meant. And none of that is is held back by any sort of NDA, especially if I don't tell you the company that I worked for at the time I did it, because um, that's for for a client agency. That's where they get really iffy. Sure. Um, and being able to do that, especially being able to talk about my my thought process, was was pretty massive. And going back to your, they they seem kind of stuffy, um, you know you can't not inject some of your own brain when you're talking about what were we thinking when we did this. Um, and actually, no, you know what? That's not true. I lied. You can, and it gets really formulaic. It's the, that's, that's that question of how did Bloom's taxonomy help? Well, let's go through the six, let's go through those six things. Here's how this project was create and apply and evaluate and all that stuff. Um, so I just kind of opened up. I just had fun. It's it's like it. I approached it like if we were just shoot, having beers, and um, you asked me about this project I did. All right, let's let's go through that. Let's type that out. But see, I again getting back to I'm going to stay on my authenticity stump here. Mm-hmm. That that's what it's all about. Like they want to know you, and if you are going to be yourself, you're going to beat everybody who's not themselves, right? Because mm-hmm. if that person fakes their way to your point earlier, and then they mm-hmm. get in and then they're sinking, two things are going to happen. One, they're going to leave the company, and then that that company has to start all over trying to find something more too. Somebody's just going to be absolutely miserable phoning it in, trying to do, you know, get stuff done. So, yeah. yeah. I think that to add to that, and I think for anybody out there who's, you know, really looking for a job, there's a false sense of security that comes from the pre-screens I've learned. Um, Cause the pre-screens are really just getting some basic logistics and ideas out of the way and making sure that you, you sort of qualify for the job. And I remember just, I would walk out of those and be like, yeah, I got this. I got this thing nailed. I got this thing in the bag. This sounds easy. It sounds fun. And then I'd, I'd actually have to like own up to the person who knew what they were talking about. And I was like, I'm stupid. I shouldn't do this. Uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is a bad idea. Um, but I got like three days to hype myself up before those interviews happened. Um, and that was, I think, a pitfall with a few companies where I came in so overconfident that when the, the, the first curveball that I wasn't ready for, I was like, Oh, oh God. Oh, I should, um, I'm going to do this interview, but I'm also going to check my LinkedIn jobs board, um, (laughs) while you're talking. Uh, so be careful of that, everyone. 
<laughs> yeah, and I mean, especially because of your story, right? So you kind of did a little teaser in the beginning. It was what, 95 days, right? 95 days. So from can you talk a little bit more country. about that? Oh, you could do a whole series on that. Um, <laughs> Well, first of all, so, how do you know I, it's 95 days? Did you did you keep track? How did you how did you do I, it? I did keep track. So the beginning of this is actually in April, though June 5th was the official first day where I was unemployed. Um, I left the position. I so I, I said I did a short stint at Salesforce, and and to be very tactful, it just it, we we just weren't a good fit. That's we just really were not a good fit. Um, so I knew in April I was probably going to start looking. Um, I just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and it's it was especially tough then because one is 2020, which already has its challenges. Um, but I bought a, so I bought a house at the end of March. This is April. I bought a house at the end of March. I'm getting married in September and there's COVID. Um, it was a, it was it was absolutely terrifying, um, but I just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, so. I ended up leaving, and when I left the job at Salesforce, that was June 5th, and I said, you know, as part of this process, I'm going to give myself a little therapy, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a daily Facebook post on my own newsfeed. It wasn't a public thing, because I, you know, I still needed to show employers that I, I wasn't as depressed as I was on some of these days. Um, but on my, my own Facebook feed, I just feel like, day one, here's how I'm feeling. Um, I think my first day one is, I am not good at unemployment stress. <laughs> that's that was that was my very first my post and that was it that was the whole post um and i had some that went you know that that were a lot longer um and went over hey here's here's how i'm doing with this company i'm excited about this interview i'm super jazzed i'm super depressed um but yeah once a day threw a quick thing out there um you know sometimes i got all, you know sometimes i was i literally just asked I need some good vibes. Uh, I'm I'm stumped on how to approach something. What are your guys' thoughts? And I got a lot of help from friends. Um, it, it served its purpose. Um, and then yeah, day 95, uh, I'm employed. Details tomorrow. Um, and it was great. Uh, and then I spent the last five days. So I, I was like, I'm going to take this to 100. So I spent the last five days kind of decompressing and and kind of reflecting as much as I could on the journey. Um, that was massive. But that's how I know it's 95 days on the dot. I, I think that's really powerful. I mean, the fact that you were able to, again, just kind of document this process for yourself. I mean, hopefully in the next I don't know, year, two <clears throat> years, something like that, when things are like really, really good, right? You can look back like, look at everything that I overcame to get to where I am today. And it just makes it so much more sweeter, right? Going through, what is it? Like you got to go through the rain to get to the rainbow. It's kind of like what, what you went through. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I kind of even went through it just getting myself, you know, ready for this this meeting with you and I. I was like, wow, there were some moments. Um, I had one moment where I was just, I had one moment where I was done uh, towards the very end of it. I had I had an interview with a, with a company that I thought I had. I thought I, I went through eight interviews. Eight? I, I nailed eight. Why? And if you're a hiring manager or org and you're watching this, why would you put anybody through eight rounds of interviews? I'm just putting that out there. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I don't have a good answer. Um, I, of course, have no problem talking to eight people for an you know for for an interview. I don't want to. I want to just get employed after the third. That'd be great. Um, but this was a small company. This was a new role. They were going to basically build, it was building the training team from scratch. So it was a whole lot of like VP level stakeholders that wanted to interview me. I, I met with basically everybody but the CEO, um, which was its own terror. Um, and I thought I like everybody, everybody I talked to at the end was, I look forward to talking to you more. And I got the, I got those vibes that, that I was just solid. And I, I even got kind of those vibes that I was it like, these are VPs. I've got an hour with each and they're in quick succession. I can't imagine you've got a lot of people that you're running through to take an hour of VPs time, literally an entire day um, across the organization. Um, I was wrong. <laughs> I was very wrong there. Um, and they, you know, they, they, they ended up kind of letting me down. Um, and I even had a post like if I don't get the day before I had a post that literally said, if I don't get this, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then I didn't, and I broke down for a, a day or two. I just, that was it. And that was, that was a big turning point in this. And that was, I think it was like day 75, day 80. It was very, very near the end. 
Um, and that's when my everything shifted for me. That's when I was just like, I don't even care about where I land. I just need to land somewhere now. I, my bank account was running out. Um, I was I was running out of time. Like the, the the thing that's just so funny with this interview process is that you've got this this you, you get that advice right. Everybody everybody who is going through the interview process, like you're in college, you're working with a recruiter, they give you the advice. Remember, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. Employment is mutually beneficial. That doesn't mean anything when you're unemployed. <laughs> You throw so much of that out the window. You let so much slide. You put companies in the driver's seat um, way more than they should be. And I think I, I did that in a couple of cases. Um, that when you know when when I flew off into the ravine, um, <laughs> we just veered off the road. Um, it crushed me quite a bit. Um, it was real rough. So then what happened? So you said you could let this get to you, obviously, right? I mean, I think any human would let something like this get to you. You said it was a turning point. Is that when you decided to do like the sizzle reel? Like what was kind of that turning point in that momentum? So the first thing that I did was I, I looked at the, me and humility is a thing. Um, it's, it's, it's why I got a ring on. Um, <laughs> it's, it's why I got married. It's one of the things my wife loves about me is, is I, I, I embrace humility, um, because I, uh, I'm not here without it. I'm not, I'm not even in this industry without, without it. My first job at constant contact as a trainer, I had none of it. I thought I was, I thought I was a hot shot and I got shot down so hard. Um, and I learned from that. So I spent my day moping after I get let down. And I, I, I go back and I think about, you know, they, they gave me very specific feedback and, and the piece that they honed in on was we want somebody who has better experience talking to executive leadership. And the thing that sucks is I have a ton of it. Most of my jobs, all I did was work with executive leaders. I was a one man show for a majority of my career. And it's hard to put that out there. And one of the things, and I got a little conspiracy theory. I got a little angry, but I didn't, I didn't throw out the conspiracy theory, but I think, and I still think that I lost it to somebody with the title. Um, I have never held a manager title. Um, so I, I reached out to the community and I literally asked, how do you get past the hurdle of leaders thinking that you can't communicate with them because you've never held a leadership position? And I got, oh man, I got flooded with, with comments and even requests to like chat and talk more. Um, and through it, I kind of healed because I, I felt at the end of it, like I wasn't terribly, like I had something to learn, but I wasn't doomed to fail from the beginning. Um, I didn't feel like this was, I'm just, I just wasn't equipped for the job. Uh, the community really kind of helped me out and let me feel confident about how I approach things. And I wouldn't change a darn thing going back, um, even if I knew it was going to fail. There's, there's nothing to change. I'm not going to fake it till I make it. Um, and that that built me up a little bit. That built me up a lot of bit. From there, I got a little bit of renewed confidence. I got kind of like aggressively productive, like when you're mad, so you clean the house. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> like I got that. From there the sizzle reel happened from there i took my old resume um and i completely revamped it um i did i did take a little bit of maybe i do come across as a little bit of a kid a little bit i don't want to say immature but not mature enough um so my resume you know looks a lot more older i don't even know the word mature a mature resume mature. um i started i got really um that's when I started asking about my portfolio and saying, Hey, I'm stumped on, I have all this work that I don't know how to show. So I reached out to a few people and I got some tips on how to show it without, you know, it just everything just exploded after I just broke down and said, I thought I was, I thought I was the, the cock of the walk there. And I wasn't for something that I feel I could have very easily changed. Um, so you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go on a confidence boost binge um and that's where everything happened and i still didn't it's not like suddenly interviews were flying through the door or anything like that um i think the wildest thing about this whole experience is i as i mentioned i went through like 30 40 interviews that weren't even pre-screens i got two offers at the same time not a single one of them came from a job search neither of them they came from 
somebody reaching out to me in the community saying, hey, I've got a job for you. And the other was a friend of a friend commenting on a LinkedIn post and that just happened to show up in my feed. And I reached out and had a conversation. Crazy. Weird. Crazy. I, you know, I, I tell people this stuff and it's like, they don't believe me that, you know, <laughs> often, and honestly, your odds are so much better when you don't apply for a job and have a job apply for, uh, apply to you. And they're right. like, it doesn't happen to people. I'm like, it happened to me. And now I'm hearing it happen to you. Yeah. It was just friend. Of, it wasn't even a friend of a friend. I didn't even know the person. It was, it was an acquaintance of the friend. Um, and I looked at it and I said, this looks like it'd be a great job for me. I'm going to reach out to him in person. That was scary. That's not something I've ever done before. Um, but turns out that's not something to be afraid of sometimes. Right. It's just a, hey, here's a quick blurb about me. I'm going to send an application, but I'd love to chat more. Done. We were great. Welcome and again, to you're beating that black hole that everybody's sticking their resume in every time doing that. Right? Because you're actually yeah. making contact with a live human being. Crazy, right? Like, I think... So, I mean, we again, we could talk for a whole hour about the actual journey and everything I went through and and just some of the most bizarre stories that came from these three months. Um, but at Maybe the end we'll of the need day, a part I, two. <laughs> Maybe we'll get you back for part two. <laughs> oh, my God. We, we could talk about the interviews that I went through, and we could do a whole thing on the curveballs that came through the interviews. So I'll, I'll tease something that may not even exist. Um, so you know, the, you know the interviews tend to be very conventional. And you know, they ask you questions about your your resume and your experience, and you get an opportunity you know, to talk about the position. You get an opportunity to ask ask back. I went through ones that were reversed, where you would ask questions first, and then nothing else. No, no asking about my resume or experience. That wasn't a thing. That wasn't a part of it. I went through three of those. That wasn't an anomaly. Three of them. Um, I went through a lot of this position is new to the organization, so we're not sure what we're looking for. Uh, I had I, I had about a dozen of those. Um, I I would love somebody to talk about how in the world to approach that, because um, not only am I selling myself, but I have to sell their own job to them, which That's was just tough. odd. Um, I had two interviews with a very well known company where the director and the manager were so off sync, I almost removed myself from the interview. It was just it was just rough. Um, but we can do we again we could do a whole thing on that. Um, but I think if, if I were to take this entire thing and break it down to the previous point is one of the things I kind of wish I learned, I knew from the very beginning was that I could defy that winning formula. You know, all those best practices, all those things that you, you throw on Facebook and you get this kind of Wikipedia bullet list of these are the things that you should do. Um, none of those worked for me. And the second I threw that away, the second that I, I injected personality into what I did, um, the second that, the second I treated myself as the smartest person in the room, that was a little scary, but sometimes you are, um, sometimes they really are interviewing you because you don't, they don't know what you're after. And again, when you're, when you're letting the company drive because you're unemployed, you, you're trying to fit yourself into what they have in mind. And that's, that, that falls apart real fast. Um, the second that I, you know, I, I, I kind of threw away that expected uh, professionalism. And there's just there's a lot of things I just kind of just chucked out the window um, and said, I'm going to show you what I can do. I'm going to acknowledge what you're asking for, and I'm going to twist what I have into it, but I'm not going to try to be your, the perfect fit for you. Um, I'm going to show you how I'm, I'm, I'm better than that fit that you're looking for. And that that changed the game. I got I further it. interviews. I got much better conversations. My LinkedIn exploded. Um, <laughs> yes, 2020 has been the year of LinkedIn explosions, right? Um, oh, so, man, cool. so cool. So no, cool. Well, I again, I, this has been fantastic. I mean, if you are watching this and you can't take a couple little nuggets away, you know, hopefully, hopefully you can, because I mean, there's just a lot to unpack here. So. If people, speaking of LinkedIn and explosions, where can people find you if they want to connect with you? Um, so yes, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I go by my, I'm in trouble name, which is Joseph Sinart uh, on my LinkedIn. That's that's why I saw my paperwork too. I'm sorry I'm blurry. I don't know what happened. My okay. camera does that. Um, but anyway, uh, so uh, LinkedIn, uh, Joseph Sinart on LinkedIn, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I also have, like I mentioned, a blog that I have ignored uh, since I got married and got a job. Um, I need to get back on it. That is training is blank. Um, so that's trainingisblank.com. Uh, so for those of you who are brand new to the industry that are trying to get a leg up on the graphics piece of it, 
for those of you who are worried and saying, oh, I'm an instructional designer. Do I need to know graphic design? Because that seems to be everywhere. Uh, I got you covered. Uh, I, I, I talk quite a bit about that. Um, you also get to get introduced to my Corgi. So that's my um, that's my incentive. Um, so yeah, trainingsblank.com. It's got a web page and there's also a YouTube channel and eventually there will be content. Um, <laughs> there will be more content. Um, and those are, those are the two big ones. All right, excellent. Well, again, thank you so much for just uh, sharing your experiences with me today and with the audience. And thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time. For sure. Good luck out there, guys. Be yourselves. Be yourselves. <laughs>